What's up, guys? If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Also, please smash that like button on the video and enjoy the show. I had connected with you back in May, and now since we put this on the calendar, you blew the fuck up because you went on Joe Rogan. <laughs> That's right. The goat scoops me <laughs> once again. That's He's right. never scooped me. Well, before, all you need here is, a, is an archery range and a couple of life, life-size yeah. werewolves and a picture of Klaus Schwab over the toilet. And <laughs> you've got uh, Austin Scoop, my buddy. You're on your way, your trajectory. You look at Joe. He's saturating, you know. It's, he's, he's you're, got, you're still rising. He's got a Klaus Schwab picture above the toilet. Yes, yeah, so you're holding your, uh, your, your business and you're doing your your business and you're looking into the cold beady eyes of a I don't think I could piss. Schwab. I don't think <laughs> I don't anything know. would happen. I'd be a little I don't know. I was like, is it the old age? Is it my uh, prostate or what's going on? <laughs> oh no, it's Klaus. <laughs> it's these cold dead eyes of the a World Economic Forum. Look at me. Yeah, that's a whole. If we go down that rabbit hole, we'll be there all day. But we got things to talk about. That's right. But I had connected with you because I had Michukaku in for the podcast and I recorded with him at the end of April. And so when that came out, I did a little mini documentary that's still on my channel now, just covering kind of like the eight and a half minute response within the podcast that Michu gave to your friend, Eric Weinstein's criticism that he had had for Michu a few months before when he was on Joe Rogan. And for people that aren't familiar with that, we'll I'll let you explain yeah. the details. But we had gone back and forth and I felt like First of all, it, be, it would be really cool to see Eric and Michu in a room, and I hope if that happens, it's you who does it. That would be really, really cool. But the, the core of that argument was over, of course, string theory, which Eric has presented his own theory, geometric unity, and string theory is obviously heavily debated within the science world because it hasn't been proven. But I, I guess where we stand almost 50 years since string theory was, was invented, where, where where are you on that issue? Do you think it's it's something where we need to move past it now because it hasn't been proven and can't be tested? Or do you think it's it's a matter of it just has too much, too much of like a little bit of an iron wall around it and we should be looking at other opportunities as well? Yeah, yeah. Well, you asked a lot of good good questions there. So I'll start with um, I'll start with the or original kind of um, statement about Michio and Eric. Uh, first of all, you have to you have to realize it's kind of surprising that in this very relatively arcane, abstruse, abstract form of mathematical physics, that there are battles every much as intense as the East Coast, West Coast rap battles <laughs> of the 1990s that you probably don't remember, but I do. Oh, I know, you know all about those. Biggie and Tupac and uh, <laughs> there, there you go. That's right. Uh, not far from here and then where I'm from on the, on the West Coast. Um, and so literally we have East Coasters, Ed Witten, Michio Kaku, and uh, then we have the West Coast gang you know, out there with Eric and, and others taking an alternative approach. So it's surprising that there's so much heat and passion that generated behind it. And Partially, I think the reason is, is that mathematics has always held a special status in the culture. Mathematics is part of culture. It's not divorced from it. It's not some thing you use as a tool to do something else um, in and of itself. Mathematics has a power to captivate the mind. And I think mathematicians and so forth are some of the most respected people in, in the world for their brilliance, for their intellect. And so it's a very different subject from almost any other subject in that things in math are not necessarily real. In fact, I interviewed a, a young uh, – um, uh, she has a PhD in math, but she's not a professor – named Eugenia Chang. And she has a book called Is Math Real? Basically, does math exist? So I always say, can you give me a triangle? No, but you can think about a triangle. Can you give me a complex number? No, but we can think about a complex number. Can you even give me infinity? No, but you can think about infinity in ways that computers can't even do it. So there are these things that are purely products of the human mind. And I think the pinnacle of the human mind is mathematics. Hmm. And, and it is the basis of all the physics and so forth that I do. Now, I'm an experimentalist. I build instrumentation. My goal is to see not if these people are right, but to prove them wrong. My job is to be the exterminator of their theories. There's no such thing as a proof in physics. So you, you mentioned like, well, because we, we, we don't have proof or we can't be proven. Nothing in physics can be proved. We can't prove there was a Big Bang. Mm -hmm. I can't prove there's not a purple unicorn on Uranus. I mean, there's no way to falsify every statement that you could make about physics. It doesn't make it scientifically accurate. But mathematics, you can. So in other words, you can determine what is property of mathematical purview. In other words, what is kosher? What is acceptable? What is part of the project of mathematics? Because it can be proven or falsified. We may not be able to do it. It took 
famously 300 years between Fermat, you know, coming up with this last theorem where he put it in the margins of a, of a little paperback that he was reading at the time before it was proven by Andrew Wiles, not far from here in, uh, in, in, in Princeton, New Jersey. And so you think about things that can be proven, it gives physicists a little bit of envy because we can't prove anything in physics. I was going to say, you, you, you don't really have, it, it seems to me like even when you look at some of the core tenets, like people will talk about gravity. Well, that'll probably never be disproven. Do we know that, though? You know what I mean? Yeah. Because th think about how short human history has even been to this point <laughs> and how much is out there that we have no clue about. Like gravity, for all intents and purposes, could be in, in an entirely different, like, I'm gonna make up a term here, but like dimensional wavelength, and we understand it. No, <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Uh, we we don't talk about dimensional wavelengths, but we will talk about uh, kind of an analogy. Imagine you put every theory that every physicist has ever had onto a ping pong ball, and you put it into a big 55 gallon oil drum. Okay, and you just pull them out. 99 of out of every hundred of those ping pong balls would have a theory that was proven to be wrong, provisional, incorrect. And I think now it's no different. Maybe it's even worse because it's never been easier to visit. A theory is like software. You know, it's it's easy to generate a lot of software and say, I'm going to go back. It's called technical debt. You know, I'm going to go back and fix up these lines in the code. I'm going to document famously. I don't know if you ever wrote computer code. I'm terrible at this. Never did. I no. love to write it. Super fun. But you're supposed to document what you're doing so that somebody else can come and do, you know, can do uh, some some postmortem analysis on why you have this bug that led to, you know, $10 billion of, you know, of Alameda coin to drop to zero or whatever, right? <laughs> so you should document it. Um, I never do it. So that's technical debt. I'm going to go back and do it. So it's easy to produce it and forget to do the documentation to do the technical debt that you're supposed to do. Um, but experiments, it's not easy to make an experiment. We're you know, I'm part of the leadership of a $100 million project in Chile called the Simons Observatory that's taken almost eight years to come to fruition to get its first photon from the universe. And it's not even a photon from the Big Bang. It's a, it's a photon from, from uh, the, you know, the planet Mars. Mm -hmm. It's nothing that you would write home about. But that's how long it's taken, 380 people, seven years working on. So you never do some, like, it's not easy to produce experiments. It's very hard. That's why every experiment, in my opinion, should be decisive. It should have a clear-cut goal in what it's going to do. Because we never know. We, we serve at the, I mean, if we were living in Ukraine right now, you know, we're we living in in um, in Israel or Gaza. Like, we wouldn't be doing physics. I wouldn't be doing. My colleagues wouldn't be doing physics right now. We'd be a scared for our lives, trying to figure out how to survive. Um, the other thing we'd be doing is, you know, probably working on a military, you know, project somewhere. A physicist would be working on some military camp, and this is true throughout history. You know, physicists have always worked hand in hand, or astronomers yeah. with the military. Uh, and so what's been really interesting to me is to see that we only get to do this. We serve at the pleasure of peaceful circumstances. We do some of the most esoteric, as I said, arcane, abstruse things that you can do that actually serve no purpose. Like what I'm doing, $100 million. You could put that to cancer research. You could put that to, you know, whatever you're saying. And maybe it would be doing more good. Maybe it wouldn't. Or food. Just buying food, I guarantee, or mosquito nets. It would definitely do more good ultimately. Um, but, uh, but sometimes I think that's what we should be doing. Because things that have no quote unquote purpose are what make human beings human and distinguish and different. I mean, animals provide for their, their kids, and there's even some notion of altruism in the animal kingdom, as Steven Pinker and other people will tell you, right? Yeah. So the question is what makes us uniquely human? It's doing things that are useless. <laughs> Useless to benefit, it's not going to make a faster phone, although phones did come, cell phones did come out of the research in radio astronomy that I'm, not that I did, but the, the legacy of that I'm, uh, you know, heir to created the technology right down the road here in New Jersey, in central New Jersey, in Homedale, in a, uh, at Bell Labs, the technology that you're oh, carrying yeah. in your pocket, right? Yeah. And that was concomitant with the discovery of the origin of the universe via the cosmic microwave background radiation that I study. So getting back to your first question. Um, these guys are doing stuff that's very important, but it may not be very significant. In other words, we may never be able to have evidence for it. Now, just because we don't have evidence, so I don't have evidence for a supernova, what, what blew up and created this little piece of meteorite that I gave you. Oh, yeah, uh, this as is a, so as a, cool. As gratitude for hosting me. And I give it all out to my uh, visitors on my website. You go to briankeating.com. I, I give those away. Um, four billion years old. Four billion years old, and I'll send you the information about it uh, when you join my my email list. You get the assay, the chemical composition. You get
get the uh, origin, and you get also a guide on how to see meteor showers because I think that's mm. super cool. And you can see them here, even in the middle in, of Manhattan. Yep, you can in see New them. York. I you can, can see, see meteor showers now, and it's not going to be as good as if you come to the dark desert of California where I, was I live. Say. Yeah, so it's going to be a lot better when you come and do my podcast. I only do it. We'll do it in person with you. You made me come up to New Jersey. I'm going to make <laughs> I'm you in. come to I'll San Diego. I will uh, be there. So anyway, so we we can look for things that we can't. Uh, we can we can see the indirect evidence for things that we can't witness. That supernova produced that chunk of meteorite. Mm. That chunk is the byproduct of a fusion reaction that terminated when a star could no longer support its girth, its mass, and it succumbed the pressure that was felt succumbed to a nuclear fusion event that then catastrophically exploded that star out into the universe. How do we date something like that? Um, well, you go to Tinder. And, no, you. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only dating I used to be. No, so. Uh, so these are dated by their composition, their their isotope ratios, and also the fact that uh, they they can be determined to have you know these the 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 metallic the same metallic origin. We compare with a model for how these stars form and then they end their life. So there was a star in our neighborhood of the Milky Way galaxy that predated our Milky Way galaxy, and when it got to the end of its life, when it started to fuse heavier and heavier elements together, that no longer gave off enough energy to bloat out the star anymore to keep the pressure needed to, to counteract the gravitational force of the of the outer layers of this onion-like star. Um, the last thing it produces is called iron, is iron and mm. heavy elements, and that's why this thing is so dense, and you can verify it's so dense. It's also magnetic. You can you know stick it to a magnet. Very this is magnetic. Yeah, it's highly magnetic. Wow. Yeah, if you had one here. Um, if you have a magnetic bobblehead, maybe that. Uh, I don't. Yeah, we got to get you one. I got to test that. So, um, and the exact composition of that meteorite is found in our Earth as well, and as well as in the rocky core of our planet and, and the other inner rocky planets. So we can date that they came from the same supernova. So the death of another star provided the impetus, the material, the raw ingredients that made our planet. And also is then found in the crust of our planet. So there's iron inside of the crust of the Earth that came from that same supernova that produced that iron mm. chunk right here. And some of that iron made itself into wheat and so forth that your mother ate when she was pregnant with you and eventually your body synthesized into make hemoglobin. So mm. the hemoglobin molecule that fixes air that basically allows you to live and breathe as a, you know, as a breathing individual, <laughs> that, uh, that iron came from the same meteor that came from or came from the same event that produced that. Now, we didn't witness any of that. So why am I saying all this? Because we also can't witness like what's happening in a, a 10 to the minus 30th meters in, in the vibrating 10 dimensional super string, right? Mm -hmm. That's not something we can have access to. But we can infer from the downstream effects what these models would predict for things that we haven't seen. So if I see that thing there, and I say that same model predicts that there should be an isotope ratio, if, if the iron, if what I said was not a lie, okay, that the iron in your blood came from the same supernova explosion that produced that meteorite, then I've just made a testable prediction. You can test the isotope ratio in your blood, and it won't be pure iron 56 or whatever it is. It'll have some isotope ratio, and it'll be the same as that. Mm. And that came from space. That was witnessed. The fall was witnessed. It's, it came from Argentina. You'll learn all about it when you click on the, the link in my, uh, in my newsletter. And that has a chemical assay, and it's very, very similar to the chemical composition in your body. Thank you for watching the video, guys. Please hit that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.